I know, of course, that I cannot hope to make you believe me, but I assure you that it is so. That handkerchief is not mine. It may have been placed there by someone in order to incriminate you. She smiled a little. You are enticing me to admit that, after all, it is mine. But indeed, Mr. Poirot, it isn't. She spoke with great earnestness. Then why, if the handkerchief was not yours, did you alter the name in the passport? The Count answered this. Because we heard that a handkerchief had been found with the initial H on it. We talked the matter over together before we came to be interviewed. I pointed out to Helena that if it was seen that her Christian name began with an H, she would immediately be subjected to much more rigorous questioning. And the thing was so simple. To alter Helena to Helena was easily done. You have, Monsieur le Comte, the makings of a very fine criminal, remarked Poirot dryly. A great natural ingenuity and an apparently remorseless determination to mislead justice. Oh, no, no, the girl leaned forward. Monsieur Poirot, he's explained to you how it was. She broke from French into English. I was scared, absolutely dead scared, you understand. It had been so awful that time, and to have it all raked up again, and to be suspected and perhaps thrown into prison. I was just scared stiff, Monsieur Poirot. Can't you understand at all? Her voice was lovely, deep rich, pleading, the voice of the daughter of Linda Arden, the actress. Poirot looked gravely at her. If I am to believe you, madame, and I do not say that I will not believe you, then you must help me. Help you? Yes. The reason for the murder lies in the past, in that tragedy which broke up your home and saddened your young life. Take me back into the past, madame that I may find there the link that explains the whole thing. What can there be to tell you? They're all dead, she repeated mournfully. All dead. All dead. Robert, Sonia, darling, darling Daisy. She was so sweet, so happy. She had such lovely curls. We were all just crazy about her. There was another victim, madame. An indirect victim, you might say. Or Suzanne? Yes, I had forgotten about her. The police questioned her. They were convinced she had something to do with it. Perhaps she had, but if so, only innocently. She had, I believe, chatted idly with someone, giving information as to the time of Daisy's outings. The poor thing got terribly wrought up. She thought she was being held responsible. She shuddered. She threw herself out of the window. Oh, it was horrible. She buried her face in her hands. What nationality was she, madame? She was French. What was her last name? Well, that's absurd, but I can't remember. We all called her Suzanne, a pretty laughing girl. She was devoted to Daisy. She was the nursery maid, was she not? Yes. Who was the nurse? She was a trained hospital nurse. Stengelberg, her name was. She, too, was devoted to Daisy and to my sister. Now, madame, I want you to think carefully before you answer this question. Have you, since you were on this train, seen anyone that you recognized? She stared at him. I? No. No one at all. What about Princess Dragomirov? Or oh, her. I know her, of course. I thought you meant anyone, anyone from, from that time. So I did, madame. Now think carefully. Some years have passed, remember. The person might have altered their appearance. Helena pondered deeply. Then she said, No, I'm sure. There is no one. You yourself, you were a young girl at the time. Did you have no one to superintend your studies or to look after you? Oh yes, I had a dragon sort of governess to me and a secretary to Sonia combined. She was English, or rather Scotch, a big red-haired woman. What was her name? Miss Freebody. Young or old? She seemed frightfully old to me. I suppose she couldn't have been more than forty. Suzanne, of course, used to look after my clothes and made me. And there were no other inmates of the house? Only servants. And you are certain... 
quite certain, madame, that you have recognized no one on the train. She replied earnestly, No one, monsieur. No one at all. Chapter 5 The Christian Name of Princess Dragomirov When the Count and Countess had departed, Poirot looked across at the other two. You see, he said, we make progress. Excellent work, said Monsieur Bouc cordially. For my part, I should never have dreamed of suspecting Count and Countess Antreny. I will admit I thought them quite hors de combat. I suppose there is no doubt that she committed the crime. It is rather sad. Still, they will not guillotine her. There are extenuating circumstances. A few years' imprisonment, that will be all. In fact, you are quite certain of her guilt. My dear friend, surely there is no doubt of it. I thought your reassuring manner was only to smooth things over till we are dug out of the snow and the police take charge. You do not believe the Count's positive assertion, on his word of honor, that his wife is innocent. Mon cher, naturally, what else could he say? He adores his wife, he wants to save her, he tells his lie very well, quite in the grand seigneur manner, but what else than a lie could it be? Well, you know, I had the preposterous idea that it might be the truth. No, no, the handkerchief, remember. The handkerchief clinches the matter. Oh, I am not so sure about the handkerchief. You remember, I always told you there were two possibilities as to the ownership of the handkerchief. All the same. Monsieur Bouc broke off. The door at the end had opened, and Princess Dragomirov entered the dining car. She came straight to them, and all three men rose to their feet. She spoke to Poirot, ignoring the others. I believe, monsieur, she said, that you have a handkerchief of mine. Poirot shot a glance of triumph at the other two. Is this it, madame? He produced the little square of fine cambric. That is it. It has my initial in the corner. But, madame la princesse, that is the letter H, said monsieur Bouc. Your Christian name, pardon me, is Natalia. She gave him a cold stare. That is correct, monsieur. My handkerchiefs are always initialed in the Russian characters. H is N in Russian. Monsieur Bouc was somewhat taken aback. There was something about this indomitable old lady which made him feel flustered and uncomfortable. You did not tell us that this handkerchief was yours at the inquiry this morning. You did not ask me, said the princess dryly. Pray be seated, madame, said Poirot. She sighed. I may as well, I suppose. She sat down. You need not make a long business of this, messieurs. Your next question will be, how did my handkerchief come to be lying by a murdered man's body? My reply to that is that I have no idea. You have really no idea? None whatever. You will excuse me, madame, but how much can we rely upon the truthfulness of your replies? Poirot said the words very softly. Princess Dragomirov answered contemptuously. I suppose you mean because I did not tell you that Helena Andreni was Mrs. Armstrong's sister. In fact, you deliberately lied to us in the matter. Certainly. I would do the same again. Her mother was my friend. I believe, messieurs, in loyalty to one's friends and one's family and one's caste. You do not believe in doing your utmost to further the ends of justice. In this case, I consider that justice, strict justice, has been done. Poirot leaned forward. You see my difficulty, madame. In this matter of the handkerchief, even, am I to believe you? 
or are you shielding your friend's daughter? Oh, I see what you mean. Her face broke into a grim smile. Well, monsieur, this statement of mine can be easily proved. I will give you the address of the people in Paris who make my handkerchiefs. You have only to show them the one in question, and they will inform you that it was made to my order over a year ago. The handkerchief is mine, monsieur. She rose. Have you anything further you wish to ask me? Your maid, madame. Did she recognize this handkerchief when we showed it to her this morning? She must have done so. She saw it and said nothing. Ah, well, that shows that she too can be loyal. With a slight inclination of her head, she passed out of the dining car. So that was it, murmured Poirot softly. I noticed just a trifling hesitation when I asked the maid if she knew to whom the handkerchief belonged. She was uncertain whether or not to admit that it was her mistress's. But how does that fit in with that strange central idea of mine? Yes, it might well be. Ah, said Monsieur Bouc with a characteristic gesture. She is a terrible old lady, that. Could she have murdered Ratchet? asked Poirot of the doctor. He shook his head. Those blows, the ones delivered with great force, penetrating the muscle, never, never could anyone with so frail a physique inflict them. But the feebler ones? The feebler ones, yes. I am thinking, said Poirot, of the incident this morning, when I said to her that the strength was in her will rather than in her arm. It was in the nature of a trap, that remark. I wanted to see if she would look down at her right or her left arm. She did neither. She looked at them both. But she made a strange reply. She said, No, I have no strength in these. I do not know whether to be sorry or glad. A curious remark, that. It confirms me in my belief about the crime. It did not settle the point about the left-handedness. No. By the way, did you notice that Count Andreni keeps his handkerchief in his right-hand breast pocket? Monsieur Bouc shook his head. His mind reverted to the astonishing revelations of the last half hour. He murmured, Lies, and again, lies. It amazes me the amount of lies we had told to us this morning. There are more still to discover, said Poirot cheerfully. You think so? I shall be very disappointed if it is not so. Such duplicity is terrible, said Monsieur Bouc. But it seems to please you, he added reproachfully. It has this advantage, said Poirot. If you confront anyone who has lied with the truth, they usually admit it, often out of sheer surprise. It is only necessary to guess right to produce your effect. That is the only way to conduct this case. I select each passenger in turn, consider their evidence, and say to myself, if so and so is lying, on what point are they lying, and what is the reason for the lie? And I answer, if they are lying, if you mark, it could only be for such a reason and on such a point. We have done that once very successfully with Countess Andreni. We shall now proceed to try the same method on several other persons. And supposing, my friend, that your guess happens to be wrong? Then one person, at any rate, will be completely freed from suspicion. Ah, a process of elimination. Exactly. And who do we tackle next? We are going to tackle that Pucker Sahib, Colonel Arbuthnot. Chapter 6 A Second Interview with Colonel Arbuthnot Colonel Arbuthnot was clearly annoyed at being summoned to the dining car for a second interview. His face wore a most forbidding expression as he sat down and said, Well? All my apologies for troubling you a second time, said Poirot, but there is still some information that I think you might be able to give us. Indeed? 
I hardly think so. To begin with, you see this pipe cleaner? Yes. Is it one of yours? Don't know. I don't put a private mark on them, you know. Are you aware, Colonel Arbuthnot, that you are the only man amongst the passengers in the Stamboul Cali carriage who smokes a pipe? In that case, it probably is one of mine. Do you know where it was found? Not the least idea. It was found by the body of the murdered man. Colonel Arbuthnot raised his eyebrows. Can you tell us, Colonel Arbuthnot, how it is likely to have got there? If you mean did I drop it there myself, no, I didn't. Did you go into Mr. Ratchet's compartment at any time? I never even spoke to the man. You never spoke to him, and you did not murder him. The colonel's eyebrows went up again sardonically. If I had, I should hardly be likely to acquaint you with the fact. As a matter of fact, I didn't murder the fellow. Ah, well, murmured Poirot. It is of no consequence. I beg your pardon. I said that it was of no consequence. Oh. Arbuthnot looked taken aback. He eyed Poirot uneasily. Because, you see, continued the little man, the pipe cleaner, it is of no importance. I can myself think of eleven other excellent explanations of its presence. Arbuthnot stared at him. What I really wished to see you about was quite another matter, went on Poirot. Miss Debenham may have told you, perhaps, that I overheard some words spoken to you at the station of Konya. Arbuthnot did not reply. She said, not now, when it's all over, when it's behind us. Do you know to what those words referred? I am sorry, Monsieur Poirot, but I must refuse to answer that question. Pourquoi? The colonel said stiffly, I suggest that you should ask Miss Debenham herself for the meaning of those words. I have done so. And she refused to tell you? Yes. Then I should think that it would have been perfectly plain, even to you, that my lips are sealed. You will not give away a lady's secret. You can put it that way if you like. Miss Debenham told me that they referred to a private matter of her own. Then why not accept her word for it? Because, Colonel Arbuthnot, Miss Debenham is what one might call a highly suspicious character. Nonsense, said the Colonel with warmth. It is not nonsense. You have nothing whatever against her. Not the fact that Miss Debenham was companion governess in the Armstrong household at the time of the kidnapping of little Daisy Armstrong? There was a minute's dead silence. Poirot nodded his head gently. You see, he said, we know more than you think. If Miss Debenham is innocent, why did she conceal that fact? Why did she tell me that she had never been in America? The colonel cleared his throat. Aren't you possibly making a mistake? I am making no mistake. Why did Miss Debenham lie to me? Colonel Arbuthnot shrugged his shoulders. You had better ask her. I still think that you are wrong. Poirot raised his voice and called. One of the restaurant attendants came from the far end of the car. Go and ask the English lady in number 11 if she will be good enough to come here. Bien, monsieur. The man departed. The four men sat in silence. Colonel Arbuthnot's face looked as though it were carved out of wood. It was rigid and impassive. The man returned. Thank you. A minute or two later, Mary Debenham entered the dining car. Chapter 7 The Identity of Mary Debenham She wore no hat. Her head was thrown back as though in defiance. The sweep of her hair back from her face, the curve of her nostril, suggested the figurehead of a ship plunging gallantly into a rough sea. In that moment, she was beautiful. Her eyes went to Arbuthnot for a minute, just a minute. She said to Poirot, You wish to see me? I wish to ask you, mademoiselle, 
why you lied to us this morning. Lied to you? I don't know what you mean. You concealed the fact that at the time of the Armstrong tragedy, you were actually living in the house. You told me that you had never been in America. He saw her flinch for a moment and then recover herself. Yes, she said. That is true. No, mademoiselle. It was false. You misunderstood me. I mean that it is true that I lied to you. Ah, you admit it. Her lips curved into a smile. Certainly, since you have found me out. You are at least frank, mademoiselle. There does not seem anything else for me to be. Well, of course, that is true. And now, mademoiselle, may I ask you the reason for these evasions? I should have thought the reason leapt to the eye, Monsieur Poirot. It does not leap to mine, mademoiselle. She said in a quiet, even voice, with a trace of hardness in it, I have my living to get. You mean... She raised her eyes and looked him full in the face. How much do you know, Monsieur Poirot, of the fight to get and keep decent employment? Do you think that a girl who has been detained in connection with a murder case, whose name and perhaps photographs were reproduced in the English papers, do you think that any nice, ordinary, middle-class Englishwoman would want to engage that girl as governess to her daughters? I do not see why not, if no blame attached to you. Oh, blame. It is not blame. It is publicity. So far, Monsieur Poirot, I have succeeded in life. I have had well-paid, pleasant posts. I was not going to risk the position I had attained when no good end could have been served. I will venture to suggest, mademoiselle, that I would have been the best judge of that. Not you. She shrugged her shoulders. For instance, you could have helped me in the matter of identification. What do you mean? Is it possible, mademoiselle, that you did not recognize in the Countess Andrigny Mrs. Armstrong's young sister whom you taught in New York? Countess Andrigny? No. She shook her head. It may seem extraordinary to you, but I did not recognize her. She was not grown up, you see, when I knew her. That was over three years ago. It is true that the Countess reminded me of someone. It puzzled me. But she looked so foreign, I never connected her with the little American schoolgirl. It is true that I only glanced at her casually when coming into the restaurant car. I noticed her clothes more than her face. She smiled faintly. Women do. And then, well, I had my own preoccupations. You will not tell me your secret, mademoiselle. Poirot's voice was very gentle and persuasive. She said in a low voice, I can't. I can't. And suddenly, without warning, she broke down, dropping her face down upon her outstretched arms and crying as though her heart would break. The colonel sprang up and stood awkwardly beside her. I... Look here! He stopped and, turning round, scowled fiercely at Poirot. I'll break every bone in your damned body, you dirty little whippersnapper, he said. Monsieur, protested Monsieur Bouc. Arbuthnot had turned back to the girl. Mary, for God's sake. She sprang up. It's nothing. I'm all right. You don't need me anymore, do you, Monsieur Poirot? If you do, you must come and find me. Oh, what an idiot. What an idiot I'm making of myself. She hurried out of the car. Arbuthnot, before following her, turned once more on Poirot. Miss Debenham's got nothing to do with this business. Nothing, do you hear? And if she's worried and interfered with, you'll have me to deal with. He strode out. I like to see an angry Englishman, said Poirot. They are very amusing. The more emotional they feel, the less command they have of language. But Monsieur Bouc was not interested in the emotional reactions of Englishmen. He was overcome by admiration of his friend. Mon cher, vous êtes épatant, he cried. Another miraculous guess, c'est formidable. It is incredible how you think of these things, said Dr. Constantine admiringly. Oh, I claim no credit this time. It was not a guess. Countess Andrigny practically told me. Comment? Surely not. You remember I asked her about her governess or companion. I had already decided in my mind 
that if Mary Debenham were mixed up in the matter, she must have figured in the household in some such capacity.' 